kicked off on his way. Jonathan is a former Wimbledon champion whose career has been blighted by injury. He once broke three ribs laughing at Jeremy Bates' first serve. <laughs> Pat Cash. <laughs> With Rory and Gary as a stand-up comedian who used to play football for Port Vale. The day he joined the club, he said, if this isn't the best club in Stoke, may my hair fall out. <laughs> Mick Miller. <laughs> Handbags round now, all about the feuds that break out between sports people, Gary, Rory and Mick. Yours concerns that blue-blooded Englishman, Greg Rosetsky, and the man who until recently was his coach, our very own Pat Cash. Here they are, both powerless to prevent Greg's exit from the Australian Open. However, did manage to transform Rosetsky's game, and soon he was beating the lights of Gustavo Curtin and Andre Agassi. But within a few months, relations turned sour. Why was that, Gary's team? Was it because Greg forgot his kit one day and Pat made him train with just his pants and vest on? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me, Pat, since we have a, a top class tennis player here, why can't we? Brits produce a, a world-class tennis player. I mean, in other sports like football, for example, we produce loads of world-class players. Gary Lineker has met some of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. That's correct. Three marks. Thank you very much. <laughs> is it mainly because tennis is a girls' sport, do you think? <laughs> is that what you do now? Do you coach now? Is that what you do full-time now? Because that's a job I've been after, a tennis coach, because we all know anyone who's seen what we call an adult movie. They know that really... <laughs> <laughs> a tennis coach is really there just to, you know, <laughs> give the wife of the rich husband a little bit of something extra. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a tennis court time, haven't you? I tell you, I'm dead crack hand at tennis now. I'm a top tennis person. You, I you played, are. You I are. played pat at tennis, didn't I? Wasn't that good? You were, you were absolutely crap. <laughs> that was a, a bad seven. day, though. How dare it you was... say that? I'm Britain's number seven. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're famous for your weak lob. <laughs> What do you think, Mick? Uh, was it Greg took the piss out of Pat's English accent? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, um, wasn't it a case of... Pat coached him, didn't he, for a while, but Pat claims he didn't get paid? Is that mm. That's about it. Over money, That's isn't roughly it? I'll give you three points for that, yeah. The two fell out in a dispute over money, right? Pat had the audacity to ask for some, while Greg claimed that Pat had actually asked not to be paid. But I didn't understand that, because <laughs> he said he didn't want to pay you, right? And you said you wanted 10% of his winnings, which is the same thing. <laughs> Greg Rosetsky learnt his tennis as a child by knocking a ball against his garden wall, but the neighbours complained about the incessant sound of advantage wall. <laughs> runs in the family for Tim Henman because his great-grandmother also enjoyed success at Wimbledon. Two years ago, she beat Rosetsky in straight sets. <laughs> David, Jonathan and Pat, your feud involves two of the Pakistan players so comprehensively stuffed by England in the first test this week. Current captain, Wakar Yunus, and his predecessor, Wazim Akram. The two fast bowlers have spearheaded the Pakistan attack for the last decade. It's Wazim Akram now. Moen Khan, and that is the fifth wicket down. That'll be disappointment for David Gower and triumph for Wazim Akram. <laughs> what is known as uh, an unassisted wicket for Wakar Yunus. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? 
<laughs> Were you actually playing or you sent it as like a warm-up follow? Is that... <laughs> Sadly, all Wakar and Wazim can agree on now is how easy it was to get David out. But what lies at the root of their mutual loathing? Was that helmet you were wearing, David, or was it a very cheap blue rinse you had in those days? <laughs> <laughs> Did Wakar say, uh... Wazim! Just one too many times! <laughs> Really piss him off. Right People do right do that all the time, don't they? Yeah. Right there. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, but he's in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> does does, uh, does Henman stand a chance, do you reckon? Because Henman, he's not doing so bad. Does he stand a chance at tennis? Do you think it's fixable, whatever flaws that he's got? At Wimbledon? Yeah. Um. That Paul spoke volumes. <laughs> I know a great tactic. I don't know if you tried this. If someone's trying to do you like a deep top spin in the right corner when they're serving, you know mm -hmm. how to stop it? Drop your pants. I'm telling you, it works every time. Uh, it, it really works against the ladies, and it helped me win in straight sets against Dale Winton. <laughs> and it's not often you hear the words Dale Winton and straight sets in the same sentence. Is it? <laughs> you should try it. If you're having a wedding. <laughs> and I think you probably have. <laughs> David, you must uh, know. Oh, it's just a family feud or something, surely. They just, just don't like each other now. They one drop the other, or they wouldn't play on the same team for a while. Or yeah, one drop one. one. Yeah, I'll give you three points. I'll give you three points. Yeah, it all dates back to when Wazim Akram was captain and refused to pick Wakar, allegedly because he felt threatened by a younger and faster bowler. The Pakistan team also includes Rashid Latif, the man who grasped on four of his current teammates for match fixing. He's easy to spot. He was the one wearing his box and helmet on the plane over. <laughs> Last time they toured the West Indies, Wakar and Wazim were arrested after traces of marijuana were found near where they were sitting, which was a bit unfair, as the traces in question were in Phil Tufnell's bloodstream at the time. <laughs> and at the end of that round, Gary's team have three points and David's team have three points. on double bill they think it's all over tonight at nine on ukg2 it's our excuses round now gary's team it's last season's tiny and weird derby when sunderland beat newcastle at st james's park although we can't vouch for the impartiality of the commentator Question's quite straightforward. How did the Northeast Derby prevent civil war breaking out in Ghana? Huh? <laughs> Come on, everyone knows this. It's easy. I'd love to have a look at that again. Premiership football. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about a third world deprived area. And I think Ghana is pretty similar, isn't it? <laughs> I've played football in Ghana. Have you, Dick? Yeah. This was for Comic Relief, wasn't it? Yeah. And is it true that I remember, because you went out there, you were with David Baddiel, and it yeah. was David Essex, it was yeah. a weird crowd, and Frank Skinner, yeah. and you played against various people think you'd win, and finally you, you came up against a team you think you'd win. It was the, the ladies' team, wasn't it? It was the, uh, it was the Accra <laughs> Ladies' Post Office 11. <laughs> it was really embarrassing flying back. You think, what exactly have we done there? <laughs> quite understand how that helped. <laughs> <laughs> you walk off the pitch and go, there's no buffet here. <laughs> I know Ghanaian football is so bad, apparently the quality is so bad, that when um, a team gets relegated, it goes down into the Scottish Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> what about the African Pools panel? I win, no way. I win, no way. Oh, <laughs> Red sky at night, Gambia's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, 
No idea. No idea at no all. Idea. Well, the answer is that the Gonja and Kankombe tribes were on the brink of full-scale warfare when, at the instigation of aid workers, they decided to reconstruct the Sunderland Newcastle derby instead. There's now a permanent peace in that part of Ghana. It's not that playing football has used up all their aggression. After buying 22 replica kits, they can't afford any machine guns. <laughs> the game was covered live by Sky Sports and their reporter, Richard Keyes. Sadly, he was captured by poachers and was last seen swinging from a tyre in a Rotterdam zoo. <laughs> I'm a job going there, then. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> David's team, here's Boris Becker losing to Pat Rafter in his farewell appearance at Wimbledon two years ago. Later that night, Boris Becker impregnated a Russian model inside a linen cupboard in London's fashionable Nobu restaurant, an experience that apparently lasted fully five seconds. However, he initially denied that he'd had full sex with the lady in question and came up with rather a bizarre excuse. What was it? David's team. It lasted five bizarre. seconds. Apparently. Who said it lasted five seconds? Him or the lady? Oh, well, I imagine it was her. I can't yeah. see it being <laughs> it. Oh, yeah, five oh. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was an umpire on a chair stood up inside the linen cover going, time? Time. <laughs> Five seconds, because I know some men do suffer from that problem. But, um... <laughs> I, of course, have the opposite effect, unfortunately. Uh. It's the ladies who finish oh so quickly. And I say to them, don't look at my face, you'll last longer, but they can't help it. <laughs> so I'm telling a child not to look at the eclipse. <laughs> this happened, what, the night after he lost... That night that he night? lost. Yeah. Right. So Boris came into the tournament unseated. Hey! Yes! So they're in a restaurant. Brian, yeah. you've got a hat off to them for that. It's a Japanese Almost restaurant. A... It's a good Japanese restaurant. A Japanese restaurant? restaurant? My, myself so and my wife one... eat there often. Really? Yeah. yeah. Good linen cupboard? <laughs> That's his fantastic linen cupboard. Apparently, Tim Henman had been in that same linen cupboard the week before. <laughs> Spent an hour in there when he came out. All the cloths are beautifully ironed and folded. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good boy. Oh, he loves his mother. Yeah. Not in that. No, never mind. So you actually. <laughs> no. So you've actually eaten the restaurant. It's a good restaurant. Yeah, it's a great restaurant. So it wasn't Sushi's Japanese sushi. Mm. Mm. I know that. You know, it's half Japanese and half Jewish. It's called the Sosumi. <laughs> Come on, which among us can say that we haven't been in a restaurant and we haven't had a little bit of extra pudding? Come on. <laughs> I'm sure, Gary, when you and Michelle go to the local harvesters... <laughs> I bet you, you go straight to that disabled toilet now, don't you? <laughs> There's like a sexual gymnasium in there with all the bars in there. I'll tell you, one of these days I might even take a lady in with me. <laughs> That'll be really a good night. It's got something to do with oral sex. I do, yeah, because didn't he say... Oral sex yeah. and <laughs> he said that there wasn't the full well, money. It was just the, it was the 15 quid. It claimed Obviously. it was out. <laughs> Not the full 25, if you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you three points. It's close enough. It's a little bit more complicated, but I'll give you the points. Oh. Well done, Pat. Boris Becker claimed that the Russian Mafia had hired the model, Angela Ermakova, to give him a blowjob, keep the sperm warm in her mouth, and oh. subsequently impregnate herself so that they could then blackmail him. Although his original claim that the child simply wasn't his rather fell to the ground when a photo of the baby was published. <laughs> Lord. Becker subsequently rubbished the idea that the shag lasted five seconds. He said, he's a gentleman. He spent the first two seconds getting to know her as a person. <laughs> the two million pounds that Boris paid up for five seconds of sex works out at 1.44 billion pounds an hour. Even Angus Deaton doesn't cost that much. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of that round, Gary's team have three points and David's team have six. <laughs> It's that time in the show where we ask the question, what's going on? David's team, take a butcher's at this. And the referee, Phil Richards, is having his attention drawn by uh, 
one of his assistants. I quite know what the problem is. They're pointing, in fact, to the mascot of Stoke City, Potamus. They're an endangered species, aren't they? Don't Stoke. even go there! <laughs> You know what I love about Nick is Nick's, Nick's love of Stoke is genuine. It isn't like a fashion. It's not people support a team just because someone's got a Mohican haircut. He loves Stoke. I believe your father was a Stoke supporter. Yeah. And I believe your grandfather still plays centre forward, does he not? No. <laughs> he does. It's a family thing. He does. <laughs> It's true. It's pointless having questions about Stoke because I just lose any sense of humour. I'm seeing it like this at the moment. Uh, Go on. But, you know, Stoke, I think, you know, they're not doing so well. I mean, it's in the second division at the moment, is that right? Mm -hmm. And even, I don't know much about football, but my maths told me that's probably not the best place to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it's got a lot to do with their strip. They're not looking good there. Now, who better to help them design the, the new look than me? Put me in charge of next season's fashion. Come on. Leopard skin is wildly underused in football. <laughs> well, you imagine how proud, you'd be, how proud you'd be to see Thorny scoring a goal wearing a pair of my handcrafted leather culottes. Come on, then. <laughs> I don't care what he's wearing if he scores a goal, fair enough. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. Is that what happens when you buy a player on the internet? <laughs> Actually, you know what? You've got to be very careful because I know you've sent away from one of those Filipino brides and you've got to be very careful what you put in the list there because they got that one just saying, I want an animal in bed with large mud flaps. And look what turned up. <laughs> you've got to specify. <laughs> you've got to cross every T and dot every I, my friend. <laughs> Although, let's face it, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you, Roy? <laughs> <laughs> was that a linesman who looked a bit like mm -hmm. Grobbelard who ran over and kissed him full on the lips? Yeah. Was, the, was the hippo offside? Is that the gist of it? That is basically, that is basically what happened. I'll give you three oh. points for that, yeah. <laughs> the hippo offside. That was all about Stoke City's mascot, Potamus, during City's superb 1-0 demolition of Bristol City back in December. The linesman thought he was a real Stoke player and gave him offside. The linesman's decision stopped an almost certain goal. That's because whenever Stoke go forward, they're likely to score because they're great. Oh. <laughs> Stoke City play at the Britannia Stadium because, famously, Rubbish. They're great. <laughs> Stoke are known as the Potters, partly because the city is the home of the world's finest pottery and partly because it's a great Rubbish. nickname for a great club. Uh, <laughs> OK, Gary's team. Oh, Gary's God. team. Nah, Take a look at this. <laughs> Number 40 is 20... Number 40 is 20... OK, Gary's team, what was going on there? Were they, were they all the toys for Brooklyn Beckham's birthday party? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We recognised the race course. I think that race course, that was where Lester Piggott won his first derby. And he said them famous words. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, can I should do something? And please, yeah. Because I, I'm, I, like most men of my age, I'm thinking, am, am I going to lose it on top? I'm talking about hair or not. And if I am, I'm thinking, will I let it go and shave it all off? Will I do what you're doing? Or will I have the old comb over? Oh. You must have experimented with it. Could we have a look? No, I've never Come on, just fold it over for us. Go on, let's have a look. This is actually a, an Irish Mohican. <laughs> got it wrong. I went to this hairdresser. He said, he said, you're going bald. I said, well, get a move on. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Is it just something as simple as mascot racing? Uh, yes, well done, three points before I go any further. <laughs> that was the annual Lucky Mascots race at Huntingdon Racecourse, won this year by Watford's Harry the Hornet. Coventry's mascot was disqualified after testing negative for luck. <laughs> Man United have had the same lucky mascot for years, Refy the Ref. <laughs> At the end of that round, Gary's team have six points and David's team have nine. Oh. Time now for our regulars to lay hands on a sporting legend as we play Field the Sportsman. David and Jonathan, oh. you're up first this week. Clear your position. OK, blindfolds on. And can we have our first mystery guest, please?
and your time starts now. Hey. <laughs> you threw an egg, you're going to get a left jab. Sir. Hey. Who's there? He can't stand still. He's, he's throwing these sort of little whirly gig things. He's not, just, hang on. He's, not, he's not a very big fella, though. He's quite weedy. <laughs> whirly gig thing won't do it. Well, it's. Yeah. Is thingy? Pat can do it. Well done, Pat. Oh, there's a clue. <laughs> Ninja King. No, bad luck, bad luck. It was, in fact, Lawrence West. That was Lawrence West, the world indoor boomerang champion. Yeah, that isn't a boomerang. No. A boomerang is one big banana shaped thing. This is like a. That's not a boomerang. That's an indoor, it's an indoor boomerang. That's bollocks. That's not a boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> is that a boomerang? No. Thank you. Try and throw it away then. <laughs> it doesn't even work. So, Rory and Gary, to your positions, please. Mm. That's a crap, the way yeah. around. It's rubbish, that. Oh, that wasn't bad. <laughs> Someone to fall back on, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have our second mystery guest, please? For one young bearded fellow, a dream's about to come true. <laughs> <laughs> I like the like young guy, that's very good. <laughs> and your time starts now. Mind the flaps, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not Audley Harrison's next opponent, is it? <laughs> oh, he's you were at my stag night, were you? <laughs> hey, what's this? Well, that Jerry Hallowell's let herself go, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> it's what's he called, isn't it? Um, Potty Mouse. Potter. Potter Mouse. Potter Mouse is correct for the reply. Gary's team have nine points, and David's team have nine oh. points. <laughs> we stagger to the close by playing the name game. We're going to have David's team go first, I think. Jonathan, if you could get it, please. Oh, uh, United seconds. You get as many names as you can, starting now. Uh, he's a tennis player. I don't want. We had a quick shifty in the linen cupboard. Come on, you know. Oh, Forrest yeah, Edgar. Boys Edgar. Yeah, okay, this guy, quickly. if you throw an egg at him, he'll give you a good left jab. Oh, Prescott. Yeah, what's his name? Yeah, John. thank you. Uh, if Brian Ferry didn't like bees, his first name would be. Eric. Not those sort of. Right, right. Okay. And the Brian. second one is you know, a lady's got. A, you call that the front something. The bottom. But well, if it was over there, it'd be the. Us. No. <laughs> What is that? If that's side, my fun, side, yes, side, side bottom. bottom. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Right. Okay, famous hypnotist. If you are on stage, he would uh, he would make you eat an apple, think it was Paul an onion. McKinney. Paul yeah, McKenna. Paul McKenna. You're also a footballer, I believe. Oh blimey. Okay, the second name. You know when you're party and there's one thing you're looking forward to more than anything else, a wobbly thing. Not your auntie's breasts. It's like a dessert, <laughs> and it's a treat at the end. It's wobble, 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 like on a plate. Jello. Jelly. 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 Okay, that's the second name, and the first name is uh, in Only Fools and Horses is something boy. He's something. Del Boy, yeah. Del Boy, okay. And the second name is uh, William Hague's wife is called. Fion. Del Fion. Del Fion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> First, okay, yeah, I'll do them all together. Well, son of God, backside. 
Son of God's backside. Christ God. The son of God's backside. Jesus. 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 And your backside, not Jesus' bottom. Well, there's a slightly less polite one. Did he say, he said he said he said he say ass? Well yeah. done. Okay. Oh, blimey. Okay, here we go. Uh, first name is a car Papa. Papa. Nicole. 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 Second name is um. There, there's a UB40 song. There's a in the kitchen. What I'm gonna do? There's a in the kitchen. What I'm gonna do? I'm gonna kill that. That what? Pasta Dutchy. What is it? No, no, Pasta Dutchy. <laughs> He's down with the ragamuffin. <laughs> there was a morning TV show and he was an animal, and if his first name was Proland, he would have been Proland. And if Pratt. it was Proland, Pratt, Pratt, there you go. Blood, it's like pulling teeth. Joyous moments okay. in your life to hear David Gow go, was it Pastor Dutchy? <laughs> Thought Pastor Dutchy was when they made you a duke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, eight. Uh, eight will do it. Mick, could you pass this to Roy, please? Thank you very much. Better get seven after all. I never got that. And Sam Sosnow. Uh, Ex West Ham manager. Harry Redner. Uh, Greyhound. Mick the Miller. Very good. Uh, this is Orly Harrison's hapless victim. He's uh, oh, Michael Middleton. Very good. <laughs> Um, this is, his second name is uh, sort of reeks of things. It's a bit, oh, that's a bit... Uh, smelly. Smelly. And oh. his first name is the same as Craig Check, the tennis player. Richard. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Irish for John. John. Oh, we've been dumbed down, no, haven't we? James. Uh, Sean, correct. Sean. And if he's playing the guitar and playing lots of riffs, he's uh, riffing. But he says he's... Whiffing. Yeah. <laughs> Same Christian name as uh, Hammond, the number one player. Deepmore. Deepmore. And this is a real... Oh, Gary, that was a real... That Stinker. Was... Yeah, very good. <laughs> this is... Oh, dear. <laughs> they're in Egypt and they're sort of triangular shaped like that. Pyramids. Very good. Italian for... Um, Italian for saviour. <laughs> you know, Salatore. 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 Yeah, and it's, You know what a woman has... You know... Um, <laughs> yeah. There was a... Book written called Something Hill, and you know it's a, it's a euphemistic term for um. Moth. <laughs> oh, this could be fun. Keep going through. Some Tories Moth Hill. It means half in America. Uh, Fanny. Fanny, excellent. Now, <laughs> uh, this is your your son's daughter. <laughs> The classic book, Fanny Hill, becomes, in the knicker's mouth, Muff Hill. <laughs> which I feel is a filmy scene somewhere along the line. <laughs> so, that leaves the scores tied. Uh, mm, which means it's tie-break time. Here is Greg Rosetsky again, demonstrating his big serve. What we want to know is, how long would that Greg Rosetsky serve take to get to the moon? Wait, At the speed it's going. The moon is 240,000 miles away. How fast is it, sir? How fast is it, sir? 130. That's 240,000 miles. 238,856 miles to the moon. That's only, no, that's only if you land on his nose. If you Did land on his cheek, it's 240. <laughs> 765 days. A day and a half. The, uh, I'd say it's in fact 72 days. David's team is the winner. Gary, Rory and Mick. We're all off to help Rory out of that ridiculous inflated mascot costume. <laughs> My name's Nick Hancock. They think it's all over. It is now. <laughs>